ago, we had a study by Elder DeWinney on the earthly service. Last week, Elder Tate gave us a study on the heavenly sanctuary. Next week, Pastor Coleman will be studying the investigative judgment. Amen. But today, I want to talk to you for 55 minutes about something that's almost never preached about, never studied in depth at all, and that's the Day of Atonement and what your duty and my duty is during that time. How many of you recognize that it's time for meat and not milk? How many of you like meat? Veggie meat, of course. Veggie, veggie. <laughs> okay. How many of you like milk? Yeah. Mm. <laughs> soy milk. <laughs> Car <laughs> carrot soy milk. Uh -oh. <laughs> well, there'll be a little bit of milk today, but it's going to be a lot more meat, and I want you to travel with me. We're going to take a broad overview of the sanctuary message and its practical lessons, and the sub-theme is your and my prayer life. Why is it that we're not praying? What do we need to be praying about? What does the sanctuary teach us about what kind of prayer experience we should have? Let's talk first about the purpose of the sanctuary message. I'm going to read the words in black. You read the words that are in blue and red and green. It says, the Lord, in Psalms 20, verses 1 and 2, it says, The Lord hear thee in the day of trouble. The name of the God of Jacob, defend thee, send thee, help, help for, from the sanctuary, and what's it going to do? Strengthen thee out of Zion. Psalm 21 and 2 says that somewhere there in the sanctuary, it's going to give us help, and it's going to strengthen us. Strengthen us for what? In Psalm 76, 1 through 3, it says, In Judah is God known. His name is great in Israel. In Salem also is his what? Tabernacle. Tabernacle. And his dwelling place in Zion, it says there. Where? There at his tabernacle. There break he the arrows of the bow, the shield, the sword, and what's the last thing? The battle. There's something about the sanctuary that's going to teach us how to break the devil's long distance weapon, that's the arrow, but close quarter weapon, that's the sword. It's going to take away the devil's shield, and it's going to actually break the whole battle against him. Amen. How does the sanctuary teach us to be soldiers? How does it teach us to, be, to, to, to break the battle that the enemy has against us? You remember when the children of Israel were traveling from Egypt to Canaan? They went up to Canaan, they sent in the, the, the 12 spies, Ten of them came back with a lying report. The people said, oh, we can't go in. And God sent them back in the wilderness how long? Forty years. Forty years. And 40 years later, they came right to the borders of Canaan. And the devil says, i got to stop these people. So he sent Balaam to curse them. When he, when he opened his mouth, blessings came out. So he went to his secret weapon. What was the secret weapon that was in the plains of Shittim? Do you know? What was it? What was it? I can't hear you. The women. The women, she said. It was whoredom in a place called Shittim. That's, Shittim means acacia, acacia trees. And the Bible says that Israel, that's God's people, began to become united with the Moabitish women. And they caused them to bow down to their gods just before the Jesus comes again, the big temptation for all churches is to join this big ecumenical movement to unite with the, with the, other church, with the fallen churches. And you know what? The man that actually did this wickedness, the Bible tells us his name was Zimri. And it tells us the woman's name. Her name was Cosby. Zimri means my music. If you look in uh, Brown Driver Briggs, or musical, and Cosby means false. It was 
They, they were making false music, but God had an answer to that problem, and that answer was a priest who was a warrior. He was a servant of God, and he was with Moses and all the, all the other faithful praying people, and they were before the tabernacle of the congregation, and the Bible says that they were doing what before the tabernacle? Can you see that there? Weeping before the door. It says that they were, I'm going to get that eventually, they were weeping before the door. And this man named, this man named Zimri, who brought this Moabitish woman, you know the Bible says that in verse 14 of Numbers 25 that he was of the tribe of Simeon. His tent was way over on another part, but he came into the tents of the Levites right in front of God's tabernacle with this woman. He says, I'm going to do this fornication in one of Moses and them tents. And he brought this person there. And then the Bible says that a man named, what was his name? Phineas. A priest named Phineas mm. rose up and he killed them. Mm. He killed both of them, the Bible says. And God had a pronouncement at that time. He said, that's my man right there. You will be a priest forever in your children because you'll do something about the problem. You'll actually rise up and become a soldier. You will have an everlasting priesthood, the Bible says. And what does Phineas mean? What does that name mean? If you look up in the Strong's, it says the mouth of a serpent. So you look it up and Brown Dobbins Bridget means the mouth of brass. He was a person that would speak up, that would say the truth, that would stand up, that would act. And God is trying to, he was a type of Christ who actually is going to rise up against the enemies of the church and put the enemies down. You can read that in Psalms 110, that the priest after the order of Melchizedek is going to strike down the, the, um, the heads of countries. The sanctuary is a building that has tremendous meaning, tremendous purpose, tremendous symbolism. And one of its main objects, one of its main purposes is to teach us how we can have Jesus dwelling in our midst, in our hearts. How he might, he, it was built that God could dwell in the midst of them. The program that I'm showing you this morning is about five PowerPoint programs thrown into a blender and all mixed together. So it feels like it's skipping around a little bit. Uh, just bear with me. The sanctuary is important because every bit of it uplifts Jesus. In Psalms 29, verse 2, Psalms 29, verse 2 says, Every bit of it tells of his glory. And um, in Acts of the Apostles, page 14, it says, Through the teaching of the sacrificial service, who was lifted up? Christ. Christ was lifted up before all nations. It says Christ was the foundation of the Jewish economy. It says the whole system of what two things? Types and shadows. Excuse me, types and symbols. Symbols is that what you're looking at represents something else. A type is a symbol of something that's in the future. This whole system of types and symbols is a prophecy of the gospel and in the sanctuary there are promises so it's a prophecy and it has promises we know that every part of it represented jesus the lamb of god jesus was i am the bread that came down from heaven he said I, jesus says i am the light of the world um, he is like a sweet smelling savor um, romans 3 says that the that, the, um, that Jesus is our propitiation. If you look that word up, it means mercy seat. Jesus is the great resurrected rod that was once dead, that came back to life and is alive forevermore. So every piece of the sanctuary symbolized Jesus. It also taught through its symbols a lot of different other truths. The sanctuary is a gold mine of doctrinal truths. In um, Stephen Haskell's book, he has 20 spokes coming off of the wheel, the hub of the sanctuary, that says that it has truth concerning all of these different subjects. The goal of the sanctuary service was actually to fix the problem of the sinner. It was to fix the problem 
of the sinner. Patriarchs and Prophets 363 says, when man fell by transgression, the law was not changed, but a what system? Remedial. What does remedial mean? Remedial, that comes from the root of remedy. It means, remedial means to correct it, to fix what the problem is. The, the types and symbols was a remedial system that was established to bring man back to what? Obedience. To bring us back. There's something in the sanctuary that's going to actually correct the problem that sin has created. Because of sin, we don't want to obey. When we choose to obey, we can't obey. When we try to do right, we can't do what's right. And the sanctuary is going to say, I'm going to show you how you can correct all of the problems that sin has caused. So we have a little poem that talks about it. And in this poem, I'd like you to read the words that are in color. I'll read the words in white. What's the title of the poem? The Captain Shining Shipyard. And that Shining Shipyard is the sanctuary in heaven. The gay flotilla set to sea as a bunch of boats, neath azure dome so bright. They could not feel, they did not see the storm cod full of spite. But miles away from pristine shore, the drops began to uh, a tempest rose to test the core and see if each were sound. The angry squall did strafe the holes with hail from stern to stem. The heaving swells of darkness called the best and worst of them, and one by one into the deep they sank, clothed in despair. Except one ship whose crew did weep and call on God in prayer. This bark, that's a ship, a bark is a boat. This bark gulped the ballast like the rest. Its frame did pop and groan. Its rudder twisted by the stress. Her coordinates, uh, no, no. you know, when you're in sin, you don't even really know where you actually are. And just when hope's last buoyant gleam extinguished in the night, God's tugboat showed up on the scene. And saved your babe in light. Its searchlight swept the vessel's length. Pump ropes were tossed aboard. Grand water pumps sucked forth with strength. Horse sailors cheered and roared. Soon, side by side, they climbed the waves neath thundering veil that frowned. Twas plain to see how tugboats say, yet ship was safe, safe not, sound. not sound. The by and by the gale played out, the stars returned to shine. The ocean flattened round about, its wet fangs left behind. They motored into where? Shipyard fair. And cast their anchors down. Well, men like angels worked repair and made safe vessel sound. Do you know that when we're saved, when we're born again, when we're converted, we're out of danger. But our ship is still not sound to sail because it still has holes in it. It has to be repaired. It has to be fixed so that it can take the seas again and sail like it once was. And the sanctuary in heaven is heaven's fair shipyard. There's something that Jesus is doing in heaven that's going to fix our problem. Amen. When God began to reveal the plan of redemption, he revealed it to us in one book and then a second book and finally a third book. What are the three books by which God reveals the plan of redemption? What's the... Nature. What's, Nature. Word of God. We, 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 we often just go right to the Bible, which is the holy book is God's word and writing. But the very first book that he spoke to is the book of creation, which is God's word where? In nature. In nature. And the third book is the sanctuary book, which is God's word in what? Pictures. In pictures. This comes from Path of Thunder about on page two. So there's three books. Nature, the God's word in nature speaks, tells its story. In a 12-month period, you have four seasons in a 12-month period that starts over. The um, sanctuary service has a 12-month cycle. They had daily service for 359 days, and then the 360th day, there was a yearly service, and it started over. And that tells us that we should read this book how often? Once a year. Once a year, you should go through um, this God's Word, the sanctuary service, and you should be studying nature year round. Now after God gave the written word and gave us all this detail about the plan of redemption, gave all Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the five books of Moses, why did he repeat those principles visually? Why did he now give it in three-dimensional form in a building? Why, 
why have this book? I think I can answer that. It's because of how God made you. Do you know that your brain divides into two hemispheres, two lobes? And the Bible says, in Psalms 119, verse 10, read it for me, it says what? With my whole heart have I sought thee. So we're supposed to actually seek God with your whole, your whole mind. Your whole mind. And did you know that your, you know, we just talk about the left brain and the right brain, and we've done a lot of research on the, the, the left brain for, for right-handed person. That's where all your verbal skills are, your rational. But they've been studying the both two sides of the brain, and they finally have figured out that you not only is your brain double, but each half has its own way of knowing things. It's almost like God gave you two minds. And the studies they did on commissurotomy, or I didn't mispronounce that, that's where they actually cut the, the membrane that joins the two sides. People that have epilepsy, they have these violent seizures. If they, if they separate the two hemispheres, it just stops all that epilepsy. And when they studied people where they separated the two halves, they found out that the non-speaking right side of the brain, that half, um, experiences and responds with feelings of its own. And doctoral studies show that its processing on the right brain is rapid, complex, whole pattern, spatial, perceptual. They said that whole side of the brain that you're not speaking with, it's thinking. It's thinking, and it's thinking rapidly, complex, whole patterns, thinking differently from the other side. And they know that children, before they ever learn words, before they ever can read at all, they think. And they think in pictures and sounds. The sounds that they hear and the pictures that they see, that's how they process all of their thoughts. They're thinking on that other side of the brain. And if you're driving down the street in Indianapolis and a car pulls in front of you, instantly, just rapidly, that other side of your brain takes over. It makes a judgment. It says, it's too close. I have to change lane. I have to hit the brakes. And it all happens just within a split second. That whole other side processes and thinks and feels on the other side of your brain. And so God, when he gave his law originally and gave it in verbal form and all through words, he also gave the plan of redemption in pictures because the picture side, it thinks differently and it sees things as they really are, things that are contrary to logic, things that are not connected to time, things that are connected to space, things that are holistic. That's how that other side of the brain thinks. And so whenever I find a sanctuary book and I flip through it and there's no pictures, I say, hmm, they missed out on the opportunity because this thing was all visual and sound. You could be completely mute. You could be completely deaf. And just by walking through this building, God is going to reveal to you the whole plan of redemption. He intends that you study these truths. What does it say there? Visually. Visually with the right side of the brain. We need to learn to think in pictures. So I'm going to show you some pictures this morning. We go a little bit deeper. Now watch this. What is the sanctuary message? What does that term mean? It's just a fancy term for the plan of redemption. Amen. Great Controversy 48 says that the sanctuary opens to view. What does it say there later for me? The plan of redemption. All of these symbols and pictures are revealing to us the plan of redemption. And the plan of redemption moves in how many directions does it say there? Two directions. Two directions. So when we look at these symbols, we've got to look at them in two directions. Okay, the golden rooms represent heaven. And the courtyard fence, that courtyard area, represents earth. And where did the plan of redemption begin? Before man sinned, it says in Desire of Ages on page 22 that that the plan of redemption was not an afterthought. That's right. It says, from times eternal, God had a plan. Satan did all of a sudden sneak up on God. God said, I've been waiting for this for millennia. I'm ready for you. I have a plan in place. I'm going to send my son, and he's going to deal with all of the problems that you bring. So where did the plan of redemption begin? In heaven. heaven. And the golden rooms represent heaven. Then where did the plan go? <coughs> Jesus took on a body and he came down here to earth. 
And he was on this earth for 33 years. And after he finished his work and was resurrected with the disciples 40 days, where did the plan of redemption go? Yeah. Went back to heaven. And Jesus was here in one department for a long time. They went to this apartment. And then after he finished that, where is he going to go the next place? <laughs> back to earth. But you see, there's a little bit of courtyard here. It's really short because he's only going to come back to earth for a very short time. Just to pick up his people. And then where, where is he going then? Back to heaven. Back to heaven. <laughs> We're going to be getting our praise on for how long? A thousand years. That's right. And after that, what's going to happen? Thank you. Earth Amen. is going to become heaven. That's right. It's like a rolling stitch. He's heaven, then earth, then heaven, then earth. Then, like, you know, it's a needle with thread. And he's going, to, he's going to eventually, the Bible says, he's going to gather together yes. in one everything in Christ. He said, said, my family has been divided. The family in heaven and us down here, he yeah. says, when I'm through, it's all going to be one family. That's right. And I have to go, I have to come from heaven, I got to go to earth, I got to go to heaven, I got to go to earth. But when I'm all done with it, I'm going to stitch them all back together. Yes. And that's called the at one meant. I'm going to bring everything back as it was. Yeah. Now, the plan of redemption has two great categories. It has, what's the first one here? Yes. Events. And it has, what's the over here? Experience. The events is what God does to rescue us. Mm -hmm. And the sanctuary symbolism is going to show you which events you need to really understand and meditate on. There are six of them. How many are there? Six. Six major events. That's what God does to save every man, woman, and child. The experiences are how we're supposed to respond to those events. Did Jesus die for every man? Yes. Will every man be saved? No. Why? Why won't every man be saved? Because every man will not choose to cooperate with God. So, so we need to understand all that God is, has done, is doing, and will do to save us. But we need to understand what we're supposed to do, how we're to respond, because sin has confused us. I'm talking about the church. Sin has got us so mixed up, we don't know what we're supposed to do. So God says, I'm going to give it to you in pictures. Just follow these pictures. Do just like this. And I will fix everything that sin has caused to us. Amen. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 3, 9, read it for me. It says what? For we are laborers together with God. In salvation, God does a part, you do a part. It's like the farmer. God provides the sun, the rain, the, the life in the seed, but if you don't go plow and pull them weeds up, guess what? You got nothing. You got, God's going to do a part. You have to do a part. So if you want to be saved, you have to cooperate with God, and the sanctuary is going to teach us how to cooperate. Before we can go any further, you've got to understand some of the symbols before we go a little bit deeper. So here's your, here's your review. This first veil is called the what? Gate of the, of the court. This veil is called the first veil. There's one to the second place that's called the second veil. Mm -hmm. What's this one called? What's this one called? First and the one back here? Second. This is called the brazen altar. The what? Brazen altar. Once you repeat that to me, this is called the labor. What's it called? The labor. This area by the white linen fence that circumscribed is called the courtyard. Uh -huh. The courtyard. This has tabernacle has when it was uh, it's called the tabernacle, when it was built more permanently, it was called the temple. And um, it had two rooms. The first and the larger room was called the holy place. The what? Holy place. And the second the smaller room was called the most holy place. Did you get that? Amen. You have all that? Yeah. All right, here's your quiz. <laughs> What's this called? Yeah, What's this called? Yeah. What's this called? Yeah. What's this first curtain called? First veil. What's this other curtain called? Second. What's that building called? Tabernacle. When it was built by stone, what was it called? Tabernacle. Both of them, the tabernacle and temple, are called the sanctuary. What is this area here by the white linen fence? What is that called? Yeah. That's called the courtyard. Okay. In the holy place, you have three pieces of furniture: the table of showbread, the golden candlestick, and the altar of incense. Mm -hmm. Say that. Table of showbread. What's this here? And altar of incense. It's also called the altar before the Lord. Then there was the Ark of the Covenant with three things in its crown. Okay, here's your quiz. What's this called? What's this called? What's this called? Golden altar of incense. That's what we're going to talk about in the last part of our talk. You had to do a lot of different things before you got here. That's the altar of prayer. A lot of things. This was the last thing before you go into God's throne. 
So we have to do a lot of things have to happen before you can pray or write and heaven moves and acts according to your prayer. Mercy. Come on now. And then here we have the Ark of the Covenant. Can we go a little bit deeper? Oh yeah. Say, wait a minute, we're going fast, I know, but I want, I want to finish because the children get hungry after a certain time <laughs> and my time will be up. That's all right, preach. The sanctuary is polyvalent. Say polyvalent. Polyvalent. What does polyvalent mean? Poly means multiple, valent means value. So what it means is that each symbol has more than one meaning. God says, listen, I don't want to overburden you with too much. So I'm just going to make it simple. But if you dig a little deeper, it's very deep. It's just one little symbol, but it means a lot. It's pregnant with meaning. And we're going to talk about some of the deeper meaning today. So in, watch this now. Objects in the sanctuary can represent experiences. This candlestick can represent witnessing. Uh, a, an animal can represent a person. That lamb represents Jesus. Mm -hmm. But God also uses areas, mm -hmm. not just objects, he uses areas to symbolize things. This area right here, the holy place, represents Jesus' holy place ministry. This area here, the courtyard, represents the earth. It represents, that's where the brazen altar, that's where Jesus died. Jesus died on the earth. So objects can represent experiences in people. Areas can represent events and actual realities. But you have rituals where people are acting out something. You have people doing things with animals. Those rituals, without any words, those rituals represent experiences and events. And if you have the rest of the Bible, the rest of the Bible will tell you which experience and which event. You have to have more than one book. Nature, the Bible, and the sanctuary, their testimony agrees. The Bible says, in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. So, so you have to use nature in the Bible to explain what the objects represent, what the areas represent, and what the rituals represent. So the sanctuary is what? What is that word? Polyvalent. What does polyvalent mean? One symbol has has multiple meanings. All right, let's go down. Let's go a little bit further. We said that there's two great categories in the plan of salvation: events and experiences. Who does the events? That's what God does. God does the events. Here they are. Let's just call here? The gate of the court. It represents Jesus' incarnation, him taking on a body. In 4 BC, Jesus took on a body. 33 years later, he went to, what's this called? And that's a symbol of? Calvary, crucifixion, where Jesus died. After 40 days with his disciples, he went up to the holy place and he did a ministry we call it the holy place ministry how long did he do it for 18 centuries and then in 1844 he changed ministry and did another ministry what's that ministry called so this room represents his holy place ministry it lasted a long time then it ended that's at the second bell and this this room represents his most holy place ministry and that's going to keep going. And then at one point, it's going to end. What is that called? This back wall represents the end of the more close place ministry. What is that called? Probation close. That's called the close of probation. People say, oh, Jesus can come at any time. The Bible says, as it was in the days of Noah, so should it be in the day the Son of Man is revealed. The Bible says, as it was in the days of Lot. We look at what happened in Noah's day and Lot's day. That's how we know how close we are the post of probation. Mm -hmm. And this white linen fence over here represents Jesus coming into the earth. This white linen fence in the back behind the most holy place ministry represents Jesus coming back to the earth the second time. There are six events that are symbolized by the sanctuary. And these are the events that we should be very familiar with. We should be able to get someone a Bible study on these things. Mm -hmm. And as you start to talk to them, about these things, it's starting to reveal something about 
God. God does these events, and in each of those events, he's revealing himself to us. They reveal God's motivation in the plan of redemption. What is God's motivation in the plan of redemption? It's love. Jeremiah 31 3 says, Yea, I have loved thee with a what? Everlasting. Everlasting love, therefore with loving kindness. The Hebrew word is chesed. That means, that means sweetness and gentleness mm. and, and just babying. He said, I've drawn you with this chesed, with this loving kindness, because what I love you with is a love that is not easily discouraged. Mm. It's an everlasting love. That's God's motive. So the sanctuary is like a prison that you shine God's love. First John 4, 8 says, He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. You shine that, that love light through the prism of the sanctuary, it breaks into a lot of different aspects of God's character. That love manifests in a lot of different ways. Stay with me now, watch this. The sanctuary is about Jesus having a relationship with his bride, his church. Paul said, interesting, I like how this language, he says, Paul says, for I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to who? He's writing to the Christians in Corinth. I've espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste version of Christ. The, the church is actually God's bride. And if you think Paul is jealous, you don't understand how jealous God is over his church. He's jealous over you and me. He don't want anybody messing with you and me, his bride. Amen. We're going to see that. We're going to see that in a little bit as we go on. So the, the events can be looked at. These events can be looked at is what God, the groom, heavenly groom, does for his bride. Look at this love. He loves us so much that he comes and he lives his life under the same conditions as the bride. He loves us so much that he dies the the death that the bride should die. For 16, excuse me, for 18 centuries, he was interceding and pleading for the bride. Do you know that, that the church in the days of Christ, that it was pure at first, Smyrna, the second church, Ephesus was pure, Smyrna, it was, it was persecuted, it was really pure, and then the church started going down. Pergamus, paganism came in, Thyatira, the papacy, and he was still pleading, still pleading, century after century. Thyatira papacy ruled for 12 years, centuries, still pleading. It's telling us about his character, that he's persistent. <coughs> the most holy place is that God takes a bride that was, has a checkered past, mm -hmm. cleans her up, mm -hmm. says, I will marry you. Come on now. What does that say about him? That's, that's like <coughs> compassion, forgiveness, love, all kinds of things rolled up in that. Where he actually marries the changed sinner and then close the probation like any husband, anybody that persistently harasses, anybody that bullies or harasses a man's wife, eventually that man will have to rise up and stop that. True. And during this period of time, God is going to punish the people that are messing with his church. He's like, I've been giving you chance after chance to do right, but you want to keep messing with my bride? I'm going to come out of my place to punish you. The beast in his image and all of the powers, the new world order that's working, God's going, in the last remnant of time, he's going to come out of his place and say, I'm going to deal with the tormentors of my bride. I'm going to deal with you at this time. And after that, when probation closes, there's going to be a little period of time, and then he's going to come back for his bride, and he's going to shower on his bride a whole lot of wonderful gifts. He's going to bring his bride home. So these events are actually telling us something about God. Watch this. Can I go a little bit deeper? Yes. Are you ready? Watch this now. Jesus, the infinite, eternal, omnipotent, omniscient God, coming down into the flesh, and walking in flesh, what does that tell us about God? What does it tell us about God? It's talking about the humility of God. That's, that's like you looking at a microscope and you see a, a bacteria about to be eaten, and you change yourself into a bacteria so you can be eaten. Come on, man. Huh. 
Come on. It's a greater condescension than that for him to come down and say, you know what? They in a fix. I will go and live in their and live among dirty people where he's never seen dirt, where it's all light and love. And he left that place to come down there. He said when he came to manifest himself to Moses, he, he set a little bush on fire, mm. not a mountain. He says, I want you to see how meek and humble I am. Mm -hmm. I'm great, but when I manifest myself, I'm low to the earth. Humus, humility comes from the word humus. It means the earth, low down. Right. What does Calvary reveal? It reveals God self-sacrificing nature. Mm. He gave the deaf hearing. He gave the mute speech. Yeah. He gave the blind sight. He gave, and then after that, he gave his life. Mm. If you want to be like God, you got to put yourself last That's right. and put everybody else first. Mm. And so Calvary is revealing something else yes. about what is a holy place ministry. Say, I already talked about it already. As the church was going down century after century, he kept pleading kept pleading his rights, kept pleading because God is persistent. Amen. He doesn't give up when things look bad. He says, I will keep praying for them. I will keep interceding. That's, if we're going to be like God, that's how we have to be. Amen. When the children are just going off wrong, the people on your job are cussing you out, you're getting all kinds, you get two flat tires on the way to, to Walmart, you say, I got to keep going where I have to be. I have to be persistent. Amen. The most holy place ministry reveals his love. Mm. The close of probation reveals his justice. Mm. And the Bible says that when he comes a second time, I have not seen, mm. nor ear heard, yes. neither enter into the heart of men what right. God has provided. But though it's going to show the, what does it say there? Yeah. When we get to heaven, God's going to say, look, brother, sister, I got underwater world for you to reign That's in. Right. I, got, I got cities, I got 10 million cities that I want you to reign in. I want you to build me. Quazillion cities mm. on this planet, on the far side of the galaxy. Mm. God's going to have so many different things, but we're going to really get to see the generosity Amen. of God. So each of these events is actually revealing a little bit more about God. Mm. And that character was symbolized by an exceeding bright light that shone over the Ark of the Covenant. Mm. And that bright light called, some refer to it as the Shekinah glory, was a symbol of all of those traits. Mm. And one of the things I'm going to see about 10 of these, it's going to say pray for this. We're going to pray at the end of our meeting. We should be praying that the divine traits of character would be in us. Amen. Though the events, as we're studying those events, we're saying, oh, I see his humility. Oh, I see his self-sacrifice. Yes. Oh, I see, Lord, give me that. Give me those traits. Make me humble. Make me self sacrifice Make me generous. That's, I'm so stingy. Mm -hmm. When I come to church, I reach in my wallet, $20 bill. That's too big. I reach in my wallet, $10. That's too big. $5. That goes in the plate. That's how. When we go to the mall, $20 bill seems small. Go to church, it's too big. Uh, so, we uh -oh. got, so we ask God to, to change that stingy nature. Yes. God to teach us to fight for things that are right. You know, when things are wrong, you need to step up and find your voice. That's right. I read an article this week of a teacher in school where a, a student was throwing staple, a stapler at people mm. and threatened the teacher. Mm -hmm. Teenage girl, the teacher restrained her. She said, I'm not gonna let you hurt people in here. The teacher, they fired him. Oh. Mm. They fired him. He got his job back. They said, oh, you, you can't restrain. They found out the girl had a gun. It was a good thing he restrained her. Sometimes you have to fight for what is right. You have to step up and be counted. That's how God is. He bears long, but he will punish those that mistreat his pride. Let's move on. That Shekinah glory represents his character. When the tabernacle was assembled, when all of the things were put in place, you can read it in Exodus 40, where they did all of these things, it says, so the last thing he hung up was the gate of the court, so Moses finished the work. It mm -hmm. says, then a cloud covered it and the glory of the Lord. Hey. A bright light filled that thing so bright that people couldn't even go in there. Mm -hmm. That is a prophecy and a promise mm -hmm. that in the last generations, God's going to take stones from, from South Bend, Indiana, and Indianapolis, and from West Virginia, and all over the world, from Africa and Japan. And he's going to take all those stones, he's going to assemble it, and get his church all together, his spiritual church, and he's going to put his character, his glory in that building that's going to shine so that this whole world
It's going to be lightened with the character of God. It happened again when the temple was built by Solomon. It says that when the trumpeters and singers were as one to make, what does it say there? Ah, the church is speaking with one voice. Amen. They're all in harmony on the Bible. They're speaking the Bible straight and true. It says that when that took place, yes. it says the glory of the Lord filled the house of God where the people couldn't go in. That's a prophecy. Mm -hmm. It's going to happen in our generation. It's going to happen. When did I say? Our in our generation. How can I say that? Because the signs are pointing that the time is truly late. The sanctuary message was a journey. That building had a bunch of tents around it, and it was about a journey from one of those tents all the way to God's throne. It's a journey from your tent all the way where? God's throne. The priest had 12 stones on his chest. One of those stones represents you, if you're faithful. And you're taking a journey from your tent, wherever your tent is, and you're going all the way to his throne. But in order to get there, your experience has to change all along the way. You can't come into God. I can't come into God's presence any old way. I would be consumed by his brightness. So he says, I have to clean you up to be able to stand in my presence. So all along the way from your tents, from here, 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 your experience has to change. And the sanctuary symbolism is telling you, this is what you need to do if you want to stand before my throne. I can't have sin in my presence. It's not in your interest, best interest to come into my presence with sin. I've got to separate that That's from right. you. That's right. But it's ingrained in you. You love it. You've embraced it. It's part of you. So you have to follow my steps. And I, the high priest, will separate it out of you. I will remove it from you. That's right. Not only will I remove it from your mind, where you don't think on it. I'll remove it from your actions, where you don't do it. I'll remove it from your heart, where you don't love it. Mm. Amen. Amen. We're never safe from sin until we hate sin. Mm. Amen. The Bible says in, in Hebrews 1 and verse 9 that Jesus loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even our God, hath given him the oil of gladness above his fellows. That's why the Holy Spirit filled him, because he hated iniquity. We love iniquity, so we have to have that change. God has to come in and say, I'm going to cause you to hate this yes. thing and love what's righteous. Like, that's how Joseph was. Yes. Joseph said, get off of me. Mm. Told that woman, get off of me. He came out of his clothes because he knew what happened to his sister Dinah, how she went out to see the women of the land and how she was, she was defiled. And he says, I hate this thing. And God says, I will put that in you where you will hate sin, where they can't make you sin. Mercy. Mercy. You'll say, I will die before. But that's not where we are now. We love sin. We're bent towards sin. So God says, I'm going to show you all of the steps you've got to follow. And if you follow these steps, I will fix you from your problem. Amen. In the tent, there are two steps. What are they? Faith. Faith and repentance. Yes. At the gate of the court, the next step was? Confession. Confession. Yeah. At the burnt, brazen altar, what was the next step? Yes. At the labor, there's two experiences. It was like a mirror. They could see them say, oh, I got something in my beard. Uh -oh. Self-examination. What was the next thing? You got to wash. Uh -oh. And then you're ready to go into the next thing where there were three Different experiences, Bible study, prayer, and witnessing, and finding the most holy place, God cleansed them from the sinning experience, listen to the words I use, completely and permanently. He cleansed them, what two words did I use? Completely and permanently. Even in this walk in here, the sanctified walk, you're committing sins of ignorance, you're doing things that you just don't know any better. But by the time you get into here, you won't be ignorantly stepping on the line. You will be walking in all of the light of the Ten Commandments. There's people right now, they go to church on Sunday, and they are sinning ignorantly. Do you know that there's still a little condemnation because of that? Did you know that? People say, oh, that's no condemnation. The times of God, the ignorance God went there. Oh, can I show you one Bible text? You have your Bible? Hold them up. 
Hold him up. Let me see. Hold him up. Hold him up. Hold him up. Don't, don't hold your phone up now. Hold it. <laughs> I see some red Bibles. Every Bible should be red. Amen. Every Bible should be red. All right, let's go to Leviticus. I want to say chapter 6. Got to go quickly. We run out of time. Children are going to say, it's time to eat, Brother Steve. It's time to eat. Uh, it's, it's, um, it's, it's Leviticus chapter 5, verse 15. If a soul commit a trespass in sin through, what's the next word? Ignorance. Ignorance. It goes down and it tells us that he has to give a trespass offering a ram. Mm -hmm. He sinned by ignorance. He found out that he sinned. Does he still have to bring a ram? Yeah. Yes, he does. And um, say, in verse 17, in case you missed it, and if a soul sin and commit any of these things which are forbidden to be done by the commandments of the Lord, though he wist it not, though he know it not, mm -hmm. yet is he, what's the next word? Guilty. Guilty. And shall bear his iniquity. And if you keep on reading, next verse talks about him err and wist it not, so it shall be forgiven him. In verse 19, just to make it absolutely clear, it is a trespass offering. He hath certainly trespassed. Woo! 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 That means that if you're eating something you're not supposed to eat, you still get the ill effects of it. Oh, I can't tell you any stories. I can tell you a story. But I, I, was, in, I was in Malawi. I was in Malawi. And there was, the church was, was worshiping under a tree, getting rained on every week. And a rich man said, ah, that's terrible. I, I'm a, I'm a, I, I think the Sabbath is right. I'm going to come join your church. I'm going to build you a church. Mm. He said, oh, praise God. They built a church. They were in a nice church. And then the, the, the district pastor came and he said, ah, we appreciate that you built the church and everything, but he got too wide. Mm. So the church came back and said, you you still have to take care of the second wife and all the children. Mm. But you can't sleep in, in that same house. Mm. Okay. He said, get out of my house. Get out of my church. Mm. Get out of here. He would keep coming up with stuff like that. Mm. He, he, didn't, he, didn't, he was sinning in, what's the word? Ignorance. Ignorance. And when it was brought to his attention, he braced himself. He, was, he, was, he, he still was in trespass. He still needed to bring an offering and all it. And it's the same with many Christians today. All, almost all of us are sinning in ignorance. Mm. To summarize the first few experiences between the tent and the courtyard, there's a term for that. And all of those experiences lead to you be standing inside this white linen fence. And once you stand, that represents Christ's right. And when you step, step inside that white linen fence, you are justified. You have a new record and a new life. But that's not the end of your salvation experience. It's only the beginning. And most people believe that that's all that there is. When you go into the holy place, there's another experience where God brings light, new light, new light. You start walking in that light. That's called sanctification. In the most holy place, another experience, people say glorification, but I would say I call that perfection when you're walking in all of the light completely and permanently. And the Bible talks about salvation in three phases. Oh, if we could just get this thought, it'd be so beautiful. Salvation comes in how many phases? Three. It says first the blade, mm -hmm. then the ear. Mm -hmm. After that, what? The, corn. the full corn in the ear. That's three different experiences. First the blade, then the ear, mm -hmm. then the full corn in the ear. What do you call those experiences? You can call it justification, sanctification, perfection. You can call it being born again. Yes growth in grace, and becoming just like Jesus. Amen. Here's, here's again, 1 Peter 5.10. Here's the same thing. Three phases to salvation. You want to be perfect? Yes. How do you become perfect? You have to suffer a while, and then God will establish you. That's the courtyard. He will strengthen you. That's the holy place. And finally, he'll do what? He will settle you. Let me tell you something, friends. When we get to heaven, nobody will touch Anything, still anything in heaven. We're told, affliction shall not rise a second time. Amen. That's right. God is going to fix us 
so that nobody, people say, you want to touch that fruit? Say, not me, brother. <laughs> no, not me. I will never, you can't force me to touch that fruit. We will be completely free from wanting to sin. Yes. Because he will settle us. He will settle, settle us in permanent Amen. obedience. It's what the high priest does. He says, I'm going to put something in you so well. You will walk in it. Mm. You will walk in my faith and in my strength. You will obey. That's right. You can, we can call it other things. You can call it born again, broken grace. You can call it, just like Jesus, you can call it conversion, communion. And you can also call that last experience sealing. You can call it what? Sealing. Sealing. Where you settle into a life of obedience. Okay, got to go rapidly because my time is gone. So to summarize these three experiences, justification is a new heart and a new record. Sanctification, you're walking in obedience to all known light, but you don't have all the light yet. But you're walking, that, you're still in a safe condition. But eventually, he brings us into a place where we're sanctified completely and permanently, and then we're ready to go home to heaven because we won't touch the fruit anymore. He's like, I can bring you home. Because the angels are worried. They're nervous about you and I. You know that? They say, listen, Moses walked a good walk. And right at the end, he said, shall we breathe for a water? God said, you're not going into Canaan. And the angels said, look, you, you're bringing these people from Indianapolis. They done messed up a lot. How do we know when you bring them to heaven, they're not going to mess heaven up? God says, when I put my righteousness in them completely and permanently, they will never sin again. He said, Lord, Lord, we believe you, we trust you, but, but Moses. So God says, I'll tell you what. I'm going to give you a demonstration that they won't sin. If you were to build a plane, it's a new plane, and you had to go test fly it before you sold it on the commercial market, would you put it under the same conditions that it would fly under are more rigorous conditions. You gotta fly that plane hard so that you would know this plane is safe. That's what God's gonna do to his church. He's gonna, he's gonna, he's gonna bring them to a test so that you'll know they're not gonna sin. These three experiences, they add up to something the Bible calls, what does the Bible call it? Righteousness by faith. Righteousness by faith. And it's misunderstood, but the sanctuary is clear. When he gets you to a point that you become just like Jesus, you'll be through with sin, and you'll be through with sin forever. Can we go a little further? Oh, yeah. Let's go a little bit deeper now. Go a little bit deeper. Watch this now. The sanctuary is important because it gives us a timeline mm -hmm. in the plan of redemption. When would Jesus take a body? When did the spirit overshadow Mary and she got pregnant? I'll give you the answer. When was it? 4 BC. There's no year zero, so... You go from 4 to year 1 AD, and you get 33 years. When did Jesus die on the cross? When was he baptized? If nobody wants to call the wrong answer. He died. He was baptized in 27. He died in 31. And uh, when did he start his holy place ministry? What year? That was just 40 days after he died. That's 1831. When did he start his most holy place ministry? 1844. He's been a super offender. When did he start his most holy place ministry? 1844. Thank you. Amen. When will probation close? Well, yeah, we know this. Very soon. Huh? Very soon, huh? Will you say very soon? Yes. If you're watching the sound of the time, I talk to people who don't read the Bible. They don't see anything. I talk to some of my biological family members about things happening in the news. They're like, it's great, it's, all, it's good, it's all good. It's because they're not reading the Bible. They don't know what these things mean. But I know what they mean because I read the Bible. And then he's going to come again after that. Now watch this. I, I, all of that just to get to this. This is a deep, this is a deep slide now. Jesus is here in the most holy place. He's about to finish his ministry. Uh -huh. And when he finishes it, that'll be the close of probation. Uh -huh. Maybe a little piece of
courtyard between here and, the, and him coming the second time. What do we call this period of time? Does anybody know? It's called something. It's called the time of trouble. That's when he's going to test this airplane and say, I, he said, angels, watch this. They can do anything they want to them. They'll never sin. Satan, you can do whatever you want. Can't, touch, can't kill them. You can do whatever you want. They will not sin in thought. Amen. And when that demonstration is finished, the angels will say, Come on, bring them, bring them up here. That's right. They, they can live right next door to me in my house. Come on, man. Because I see they're through with sin. Mm -hmm. They're through with rebellion. See, what's going what's gonna to happen at this time here, the little time of trouble, this world's going to get crazy. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you something. When Moses came to, to Egypt, He's, after 40 years, he said, Lord, send me to set you guys free. They're like, the elders said, yes, the Egyptians are doing us wrong. Pharaoh heard it. Pharaoh said, uh-uh, uh, -uh, uh -uh. He said, let more work be added to them. Let them make bricks without straw. The elders came back to Moses. You don't cause this to stink in their eyes. Those, the, the children of Israel weren't ready to leave That's Egypt. Right. They had gotten comfortable and soft. So God said, I'm going to put fire to you. I'm going to put fire to you so that you'll want to get out of here. That's what God has to do to us. We're so attached to this world, God says, you know what? I'm going to let this world start crumbling. I'm going to let all your electricity be shut off. I'm going to let war come to America. I'm going to let some things happen. There'll be drought. There'll be no water. After a while, you're going to start saying, I've got to get, get off of here. Mm. God's going to allow some things to happen here before probation closes. And then the time of trouble, it's going to go off the rails. It's going to go off the rails. And we'll be growing all through here. And when we get to here, we'll be growing still. Not to get victory over sin. You already had victory over sin. But inspiration says your earthliness will be consumed. Yes. Sometimes we walk a certain way. And it's an earthly walk. Time of trouble, you'll be walking differently. <laughs> oh, everything from this world will be gone. That's right. All these things that you think are so important. Well, I can't kneel because I'll get my dress dirty. Oh. You'll be kneeling in the dirt. You'll be happy to be in the dirt. It's either the dirt or prison That's right. or being tortured. Preacher. All of my hair and all that. You won't be worried about your hair at that time. <laughs> hair won't be important. God says, I'm going to bring you to a point where you'll only be thinking one thing. I don't want to dishonor God. That's right. Whatever I do, I don't want to dishonor him. Amen. I want him to be pleased with me. And so that means that he has to accomplish something in this ministry right here. Yes. What's it called? Most ministry. So that when probation closes, you will walk in righteousness when there's no safety net. Here is the inspiration. It says, those who are alive when the intercession of Christ shall cease in the sanctuary above are to stand in the sight of a holy God without a mediator. Their robes must be, what does it say there? Spotless. Their characters must be purified by sin. Now watch this, it's going to tell us how. Purified by sin, how? By, by the blood of sprinkling. It says, through the grace of God and their own blood of God. So when the priest is sprinkling blood, something is going to happen in your soul. Come on. It's Jesus' blood, and he's going to take his finger, and he's going to start sprinkling it. And that's going to change something in you. That's, right. that's if you're in there. Mm. If you're back in your tent, you get nothing. Mm. But if you move from your tent to the courtyard, from the courtyard to the holy place, from the holy place, you're, you're, you're those 12 stones. You've gone into the most holy. He says, I got something for you. I got something for you. I'm going to show it to you in the Bible. I, Psalm 68. My time is up, and I'm only showing you half the slide. Psalm 68. Look at this here, Psalm 68. The Bible says, And let them make me a sanctuary that I may what? Dwell among them. Psalm 68 is going to tell us how he's going to come and dwell among us. It says in Psalm 68, verse 18, that Jesus, after he died, ascended on high, says, Thou hast led, I like this phrase, captivity captive. Mm. Ooh, stop right there. The whole process of Satan chaining you up, he's going to make that process captive to him. Mm. He's going to make captivity captive. Mm. He's up in heaven now. He says, Thou, our high priest, has received 
gifts for men. The high priest is receiving gifts from the Father. Gifts for men. I like this next phrase. Yay. For the rebellious also. Say amen. amen. That's for you and me. He says, I got, I'm going to receive gifts for you, the rebellious ones. Why? Verse goes on to say, that the Lord God may dwell among them. Hmm. Thus is the Lord who daily loads us with benefits. Mm. He's receiving something from the Father, and then he's going to load that on us. Psalms 103 talks about those benefits that he loads upon us so that we can obey. And that's how he will come and dwell among in us. And he will come in us in such a way where he can close the sanctuary in heaven says they won't sin anymore. Test them any way you want to. They're straight. Let's go on. It's going to tell us how it's going to be spotless. It says, by the grace of God and their what? All those the effort, they must become conquerors in the battle with evil. Watch this. Next week, Pastor's going to talk about this while the investigative judgment is going forward in heaven. Mm. While the sin of penitent believers are being what? Removed. From the sanctuary, there is a special work of purification, mm. of putting away of sin among God's people. This work is more clearly presented in the messages of Revelation. Woo! That's a whole sermon right there. There's something in the Revelation 14 messages that's going to tell you how to clean up your life. Those messages go with, you know, there were four pillars to, on the second veil, four pillars. And if you put one angel between four pillars, you end up with how many angels? One, two, three uh -huh. angels. And those three angels are going to say, listen, you need to respect God. You need to bring glory to him in your whole life. You need to worship him. Get up in the morning and worship him. And even before you go to bed, they're going to tell us how you can clean up your life yes. and be ready for when he comes the second time. Mm. And when that probation closes, there'll be no safety net. Mm. You'll be walking the tightrope with no safety net. And here it is. How can we do that? That's impossible. Isaiah 59 tells us how. And he saw that there was no man and wondered that there was what? No intercessor. intercessor. That's right. Well, how can they survive? Therefore, his arm brought salvation unto him. And his what? Righteous. His righteousness, it sustained. That's right. That, that's the answer right there. In his most holy place ministry, he's going to put his righteousness in you and it will sustain you. Yes. When there's no mediator, you will walk in obedience just as Adam did before he sinned. Your heart will recoil in hate transgression and you yes. will walk through his grace, his spirit, Amen. and his power, you will obey. That's right, man. Go ahead, preach. Don't worry about that. Keep preaching. Can go a little bit further? Yeah. Go ahead. Can I hold on you for a few more minutes? Go ahead. Amen. Preach. How do you enter into that experience? How do you, how do you get into this? What do you have to do to, 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 to get to the point where you don't want to sin, that you want to obey, that you love righteousness? How, what are the lessons that were symbolized by this three-dimensional building that's symbolizing the whole plan of redemption? Well, to explain that, we have to talk about the symbolism of the rituals. Mm. They acted things out, a man and an animal and blood, and, and they were acting things out. And that ritual symbolized some things that we have to do, that you have to do. Mm. And we'll just talk just briefly about the ritual. For 359 days a year, because the Jewish year had 360 days. Mm. For 359 days, they did a service. It was called the daily service. Uh, I mean, uh, don't want to talk to you about this. Mm -hmm. They were ministered, they would catch blood, and that service brought a big blessing called, what does it say there? Forgiveness. Forgiveness <coughs> with some cleansing. It was done how often? Every day. Every day. You can find it in Leviticus 4, 5, and 6. But at the end of the year, they had a service called the yearly service. It was also called the Day of Atonement. And that service brought, what was the big blessing? Cleansing. It brought cleansing. What did the daily service bring? Yes. A little bit of cleansing. The daily service brings cleansing with some forgiveness. Mm. Do you still need forgiveness today? Oh, yes. yes. 
You know what? The daily service was actually done on the Day of Atonement. In case anyone sinned that day, they could be forgiven. Say praise God. Praise God. It's going on today still. That's right. It's in the most high place, but he's still doing the daily service a little bit. So that if you should happen to sin, he said, I got you. Amen. I got you. You know how God looks at us? He looks at us as victims. He doesn't get angry when we fall. He says, you know what? Sin really messed you up. But I'm going to clean you up. Amen. And so he's patient with us. His heart, he only has good thoughts. He's not like a hard master. He's like, that's okay. Get up. I have grace for you. I have wisdom for you. In the daily service, let's talk about that. Two slides in the daily service. In the daily service, God's trying to get rid of rebellion. Yes. In Numbers chapter 17, it says that when Korah, Dathan, and Abiram had rebellion, those men were killed and the 250 princes. And God said, those censers are holy. They had censers. They said, we're going to offer an incense. And God said, let the ground open up and swallow these rebellious men. The ground swallowed them. God said, gather up those censers. Cast the fire out. And beat those censers into plates and put it on the front of the altar. Mm. That's the rebellion that this cross, the Calvary, is going to take, take out of every man and woman and child's heart. Every one of us had that same rebellion of Korah in us. Mm. And how did God get rid of it? Watch this. This is the cure for sin. Watch this now. He had them in the daily service. He said, go out there and get a lamb. Mm -hmm. Get a spotless, good-looking lamb. Yes. Put it under your arm and walk that thing down to my sanctuary. And then I want you to cut its throat. Mm. It should be your throat that should be cut, but I want you to cut this innocent lamb's throat so that you can get just a little glimpse of what sin has done to Jesus. Every day he had to look at this animal and say, I'm sorry that I... I'm sorry that I have to do this. He's done nothing. And he had to, the Bible said, put his whole weight on it. It wasn't like this. He had to put his whole weight and crush the face of that thing into the sharp gravel and said, I'm sorry I have to do this. And every day he would look at that and it would cause him to think of the suffering of Jesus. The spotless, stainless, loving Savior. And a desire would begin to come up in his heart that he wants to end God's suffering. Brothers and sisters, you don't get anything else. That is the cure for sin. When you start saying, I don't want to hurt God anymore. You know, when you see what sin does to yourself, you're like, yeah, I got these rashes from not eating right. But when you see sin messing up your kids, you're like, that's, sin. that's messing my child. But when you understand what sin does to God, and you say, you know what? I'm tired of trampling on his heart. After all he's done for me. Yes. He's done so much for me, I'm tired of hurting him. That is when you start to be free from sin. Zarvejah says it would be well if we spent what? A thoughtful hour each day contemplating Christ's life. Especially what? If we would just take a little bit of time to think. Jesus is suffering because of our hard-headedness. My hard-headedness something you can pray about. We need to start praying, praying that we will start desiring to end the suffering of God. In the book Education, it says, few give thoughts to the suffering that sin has caused our Creator. All heaven suffered in Christ's agony, but that suffering did not begin or end with His manifestation in humanity. The cross is a revelation to our dull senses of the pain that from its very inception, sin brought to the heart of God. Every departure from the right, every failure brings grief to him. We bring grief to God. God says, oh, not again that they're doing that. It hurts him. Every time we sin, we're hurting him. The Bible says in Hebrews, we're crucifying him afresh. And if we stop to think about that, we'll say, no more. God, you've been so good to me. I never want to trample on your face again. I never want to spit on you again. I want to treat you well. And the daily service was working not only to get pardon and forgiveness, but for you to have an enmity against rebellion and sin. Got to move on. 
daily service, and yearly service. Watch this now. We're gonna go, we go a little bit deeper now. Watch this. We're gonna get, we gonna get real deep for time. You're like, whoa, what are you talking about? Watch this. In the daily service, all the sin and all the tents, they would come, they would confess it over the animal, they measure the blood, they measure the blood inside. The sins were going from the tents into God's house. Mm -hmm. From the tents into God's house. Yes. In the daily service, sins were transferred. What direction was it said they were read? In. They were transferred in. Mm -hmm. In the yearly service, watch this. They're going to take blood that doesn't have any sin on it, mm -hmm. sprinkle it in the same place, and that's what brings the sin O-U-T. It brings the sin what? Oh. Oh. If you get that, you've got a lot. In the year daily service, sins are going into God's house. But since 1844, God says, it's time to get sin out of my house. Mercy. I'm going to take it out of my house, put it on Satan's head. I'm going to burn up every sinner that won't let it go. And I'm going to take sin out of the universe forever. It's going out. Mm. It's going to cause you my heart pain for 6,000 years. Plus, when Lucifer sinned from before that, I'm going to get rid of it. His plan is going to bring, put sin out of the universe. That has tremendous ramifications for you and me. How many people? All. It says all need to become intelligent in regard to the Book of Atonement, which, what's the next three words? It's going on. And what is Jesus doing right now? He's bringing the bad things out. Watch this. Uh -oh. When this grand work is seen and understood, those who hold it will do what? Work. Yeah. In oh, harmony with Christ. What is he doing? He's taking the bad out. things out. Mm -hmm. What is he doing? Taking the, out. taking the bad things out. Mm -hmm. How do we have cooperate, it says, by three things. Study, contemplation, and prayer. We will be brought into harmony with Christ. What is Christ doing? Taking the bad things out. Did you guess that? Mm -hmm. What three things? Study, contemplation, and prayer. Mm -hmm. If you don't have time mm -hmm. to read your Bible, uh -oh. that's not enough. To study. Mm -hmm. Study means you learn it. Somebody asks you, you can tell them where it's found, what it means. And then contemplate it. If you don't have time for that, you'll never get to the point where you can take the bad things out. This about 10 days ago, I, I watched, I bought a big TV, the biggest one I could find. I don't know how big, 65 inches, I'm putting it up right in front of my, my little reclining chair. And I only watch the news when I eat my supper for 30 minutes. I've been, I've been doing it for a few months now. And I woke up there in the morning, God said, get rid of it. Pack it up and send it to the barn. My barn is full of junk. I mean, you can't even find what's in my barn. It's so much junk. And God said, send it to the junky barn. Get rid of it. And I woke up. I said, said get rid of my TV. The Lord said, everything you're watching is violence. Mm. Violence in the streets of Indianapolis. Violence in Ukraine. Viol God says, I destroyed the antediluvians because of violence. Mm. Get rid of it. You have to start contemplating. God will speak to you. He'll say, make a change in your life. Our high priest is now in the process. Read it for me. What is the last few words? Taking bad things. Taking bad things. I missed the word. Taking bad things out. So he wants to take sin out of our nature. Evil thoughts out of our mind. Toxins out of our body. Yes. So if you're going to work hovering with him, you got to get the bad things out. Yes. If you want to go into the most holy place experience, you got to get everything that's polluting you out of you. Amen. So that your mind, your thoughts, your heart, yes. your body, your spirit can be clean. Amen. Whew. I'm going to run through this in five minutes. In the day of atonement, you did a lot of different things. The first thing they did is they took two goats and they cast lot. This is Leviticus 16 in pictures. Watch this. They took two goats, they cast a lot. They pulled out of a box a golden thing and it said, go to the Lord. The other one said, scapegoat. Mm -hmm. And they put them on each of the, 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 the goats. And the goats stood there and waited for their part in the service. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you something. In 1844, there were two big movements in the world. There was the Advent movement, and then it was all of this darkness. It was mm. evolution, atheism, Darwin, um, theosophy, um, spiritualism. All those things exploded right in the same time. It was just two choices. You're going to follow either Satan or God at that time. God always puts it in stark, stark contrast. Thank you. Um, when Jesus 
was about to be crucified. He's about to start his holy place ministries. It was Jesus over here and Barabbas on the other side. It was, it was one goat and another one. And God says, it, it says in effect, I want you to choose who you want to be like. Come on now. Which one you want to be. That's happened the day of atonement again. Two goats, escape yeah. building and go to the Lord. And then they do a service with, with a bull. And that bull, the Bible says in Leviticus 6, was sacrificed for himself and for the priest's house. Now, Jesus didn't have any sins, so there was no sacrifice necessary for him. But Aaron and them had sins. Mm -hmm. So they had a sacrifice for himself, but also for his house. And that represents his wife and his children. Now, once you get this, it's a very important point. On the Day of Atonement, if you want to be in the Most Holy Place ministry, the first work you have to do is with your family. Before you deal with the goat, which is for the whole church, you got to deal with the bull, which is a more expensive animal for your family. The bull sacrifice before the goat teaches that the work of cleansing and restoring the family must be done. What's that word there? Before working for the church. Satan hates the family. He hates the family. And he's caused so many problems in our home. There's so much estrangement, alienation. But our work for Christ is to, what's that next word? Yeah. With the family where? In the home. That's the hardest place to work. Your kids, sometimes they just, when they get to a certain age, they're like, I don't want to hear it. Mm. So you've got to repackage it and bring it again another way. And sometimes your kids will get so headstrong, well, they'll have to move out of your house. I had to tell my son, there's only, there's only one captain of this ship. Mm. If you're too grown to listen to dad, you're too grown to live here. But you will not run my house, in my house. While I'm alive. Mm -hmm. He said, all right, I'm gone. And he moved out at 16. He says, the first work of Christians, which work? The first, first work of Christians is to be united where? Oh, it says, then the work is to extend to their neighbors, not in the far off. We have to pray and work for estranged family members. We have uncles, we have cousins, we have parents, we have children that don't know God. And God says, work for them. Mm -hmm. Pray for them. Yes. Break your heart for them. Minister to them. Do gifts of kindness and love to them. Fight for them. Don't let Satan chain your children, your uncles, your aunts, your cousins, your mother. Don't let them chain them. Tell them, I start praying for them and say, I will pray you through and fight for your family. The priest then goes in and puts incense and he starts burning in the holy place. That represents Christ's righteousness. Aaron couldn't walk in there unless he had incense or blood. That's what allowed him to come into God's presence. And then he takes his finger and he sprinkles it in two places. Watch this. I know you guys are tired, but just hold on five more minutes. He sprinkles it two places. He sprinkles it, it says U-P-O-N. What does that mean? Upon the ark. And then he sprinkles it B-E-F-O-R. What does that say? Four. That means it falls on the floor. Mm. What in the world was that? What was that? He's going to cleanse the people who fit on the ark, and he's going to cleanse that room. Mm. That's God's house. God has been, his, his reputation has been sullied. It's been dirtied by the church. People think Christians, Christianity is a joke. They don't see obedient people. God says, you brought reproach upon me, but I'm gonna, at this time, I'm going to produce a, a righteous people, and it's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to rehabilitate my reputation. Amen. I'm going to clean my own house hmm. and my reputation. Yes. And he sprinkles it with what? He sprinkles it with what? That's a whole... Symbol and so that's a whole one hour study right there. I'm going to skip through that. That finger, that putting forth of the finger represents the character of Satan mm -hmm. that his church has. We have been struggling in and out with having his character. Mm -hmm. And that, that finger, that putting forth of the finger, it's going to be dipped in blood. It's going to be cleaned out of the church yes. once and for all, yes. no more. The word devil, you know what that word means? Look it up. In Greek, it's di diabolos. It means a false accuser. It's Satan that does this. And it's in every human being. I'm in Adam and Eve sin. What did Eve say? The man that you gave. What did Adam, Adam said? The woman that you gave me. The, woman, the, the, the serpent. serpent. 
We always do this, this, this. God says, I'm going to take his character out of my church. It'll no longer be that. I'm going to dip that finger in blood and cleanse it out. By the way, Isaiah 58, the true fast, it says that was the problem with the church, the putting forth of the finger, the yoke. You're going to do my rules. You're going to do it my way. God says, I'm going to take that out of you. Look at this here. The Bible actually talks about the last days. The whole church is full of devils. Mm. Diabolos. That's that same word. It's in 2 Timothy 3. It says that in the last days, perilous times will come. False accusers. That's the same word. Mm. The church is full of these people that they're always accusing. Mm. And God's going to clean it. What does that finger represent? Remember how Ten Commandments were written? How was it written? What does that mean? What does it mean that it was written with his finger? Jesus explains it. What is the finger of God? There's a story where Jesus cast out a devil. And they said, you have Beelzebub. Remember that story? It's in two books. And Jesus gave a very interesting answer. Look what Jesus said. He said, if I, with the what? Finger of God. Cast out devils, kingdoms come to you. Luke's version, Matthew's version says, but if I cast out devils by the spirit. So what is the finger of God? Spirit. It's this Holy Spirit. Mm. Mm. So when the high priest is sprinkling blood with his finger, he's doing something with his Holy Spirit to his church. Yes. And Christ Alvarezman says, every imperfection of character is sin. So Jesus is gonna, he's gonna, by his Holy Spirit, he says, I'm gonna fix their character once and for all right now. I'm gonna sprinkle it not once or twice, but seven times, and his spirit's gonna come down. And our characters will be sealed. We'll be just, Amen. I got it, God. I got it now. I'm not going to rebel against you anymore. And when that happens, the blood will sprinkle on the floor. It will, the God will say, now my house is clean. Yeah. I got a church that is clean, that's obedient, that can do my will, that can represent me right. Yes. And now I got one more work. He's going to lead and go to the holy place. He's gonna, he's gonna fix us. He's gonna fix us. Say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Here it is. I got it in my time. I've gone too long. I've got it in. But here it says, and I'll just do three slides and we'll pray. Here it says that the central foundation, the central pillar of our whole faith, the Advent movement, was Daniel 8:14. That was the central pillar and foundation. Read that for me. What does it say? Unto 2,000 and days, then shall the sanctuary be. What's the next word? Cleansed. What does that word mean? We always think that cleanse means to just to wash. It's like you're dirty with sin, so God's going to wash you. It does mean that, but it means much more than that. Yes. That word is sadak. Say, say sadak. 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 And what is Sadat in Strong's? It means to make right. What does Sadat mean? Make right. It means to make right. New, New American Standard Bible. Here's it more accurate. Then shall the holy place be what? Daniel 8, 14. Then the temple will be? Made right. Made. That's what it means. It means that he fixes the boat. It's not just being towed, he repairs it mm. so it can sail again. Yeah. And the most holy place is going to do something for us where we're going to say, I don't want to sin anymore. And that's how his sanctuary mm. will be vindicated. We're going to stop there. I've gone way over my time. I knew when I was preparing this talk, I kept telling my wife, I can never finish this. <laughs> it's like 100, 110 slides. And there's slides that you can't go too fast over. But in the symbolism of the third book, what's the first book? The book of nature. The second book was the book of the holy book. And the third book was the sanctuary. In that book, God explains to us how he can make us right again. Isn't that a marvelous? And don't you want to be free and fixed and corrected? Do you want, do you want to be able to obey do you want to love obedience yes. and hate sin? I don't see too many hands up. Raise your hand if you, you want to hate sin. You want, you want God to actually change yes. your whole orientation. The answer for that is in the sanctuary. In 1844, he says, I'm going to go.
to properly restore my church. And then I will bring my bride to fight with the beast and his image. I will do miracles. We never did get there, but the Day of Atonement, he leaves the Most Holy and he comes to the golden altar and he puts blood on the horns and he restores it. And that's when the church will have omnipotent prayers. When they pray, things will happen just as if in Jesus prayed. And that's what's going to trouble the king of the north. You throw those people in prison, and their the prison gates open. You go to kill them, your weapons will fall off powers. That's right. You go to arrest them, they'll be whisked away, as Peter was whisked away. They're in another city. They're in Ukraine. Now they're at the Vatican. They're in the Pope's bedroom, preaching and burning and mixing. I'm giving you a great controversy right now. They're going someplace else. They won't be able to stop this movement That's right. That's right. because they will do, he says, he says, the works that I do, you will do because I've gone unto my Father. If you'd like to be free from sin and to have a new experience and have a new prayer life, bow your head as we close in prayer. I went to